Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 17, and uh, we're going to pick up from verse 16. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. I think the words might appear on the screen as well. <laughs> uh, I, I thought the technical team were doing so well, and, and I even thought that so touching. Did you notice that, that they even put the words of the songs with American spelling on the screen, just, <laughs> just so that you'd feel at home and know what we were singing about? And I, I, I was just very touched by that little special. Right. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to press on with the reading, and and it might appear or it might not, and it's a good lesson to all of us to bring our Bibles with us. So, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse uh, 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, that's Silas and Timothy to join him from Berea. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Of worship, I even. You are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not. Built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Amen. Well, we're coming to the end of our sermon series, Spirit Sent, following Paul and his companions on their mission trip. Uh, We began all those weeks ago as they were sent out from Antioch in Acts 13, and we've been following them ever since. And today, Paul's mission trip, in some ways, reaches something of a climax as he reaches Athens, the, the, the cultural heart of ancient Greece, in many ways, the cultural heart even of the Roman Empire. There he is in Athens, ancient Greece. And that gives me the opportunity, and it may not come again, to tell my ancient Greek joke. So, so here we are. A, a man walks into a tailor's shop in ancient Greece holding a pair of trousers. Have you heard this one before? A man walks into a tailor's shop in ancient Greece holding a pair of trousers. The tailor took one look at the, the trousers in his hands and then one look at the man who's holding them, and his eyes light up, and he said, Euripides. 
And the man looked back at the tailor, and his eyes lit up, lit up and he said, Eumenides! <laughs> I was hoping for a better reaction, but uh, I, 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 I quite liked it. And, and a- Athens was the, the birthplace of Euripides, uh, though he had been dead and buried for several hundred years by the time Paul arrived. Perhaps you'll uh, recognize the names of some of the others uh, who knew Athens as their home over the years. Socrates, Plato, uh, Aristotle, Epicurus, they were all long dead by the time Paul got there, um, but their legacy lived on, meaning that Athens really did indeed continue to be the cultural heart of the empire. It was a beautiful place, filled with stunning architecture and literature and poetry and art and education and music, a place that Paul would have heard all about, and, and now here he is. Uh, he had left Berea in something of a rush, Uh, When people arrived there to attack him, the people there bundled him off in safety to Athens. Now he has some time to spare as he waits for his partners in mission, uh, Silas and Timothy, to join him. And uh, we're going to have lots of M's this morning to think about. Um, Most of them are new, and uh, this is our first. This is a new mission field, a new mission field. Paul had previously been in areas where there had been plenty of Jews, And he began his mission in each of those places amongst the Jews in the synagogues or other places of worship. But here is a new mission field. Uh, He finds himself in a multicultural place, mixed up people with mixed up beliefs, mission in a mixed up world. And that suggests that there may well be quite a lot that we can learn from Paul's experience there in this new mission field. I don't know about you, but I often seem to find myself surrounded by mixed up people with mixed up beliefs in a mixed up world, and I'm not even talking about church meetings. So this, is, this is the wider world that I mean, and uh, our own society, our own culture isn't so different from the pagan culture of Athens. The first thing for this morning, a, a new mission field, and secondly, Paul finds a new motive, a new motive. Uh, Luke tells us in verse 16 that as Paul wandered around Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. It could be translated as being submerged in idols. He was greatly distressed. Isn't that interesting? He wasn't filled with awe at the beauty of the city. He wasn't filled with curiosity at all he could learn about the culture of the place from these strange little things that surrounded him. No, he was filled with great distress. We we could think for some time this morning, for a long time, about all that the Bible has to say about idolatry. And, and all the ways in which our world is filled with idols too, just uh, not ones that are made of stone and wood uh, like those were, but we, we don't have time for that. Let's just ask ourselves the question, why was Paul so greatly distressed at it all? Well, these idols did two things. They robbed God of His glory, and they robbed the people of their good. They were sucking the life out of the place, sucking the life out of the people. It's, it's a good translation to say that they were submerged by idols. They were drowning it in all. We, we were created to worship God. It's a life-giving thing to do. And when we don't do that, when we worship other things, it robs God of His glory, and it robs us of our good. It, it sucks the life out of us. We don't worship things made of wood or stone these days, but we still worship other things, don't we? Just look at crowds in football matches or pop concerts. I'm sure it happens at baseball matches too. Just watch people running around after celebrities or power or money or possessions or prestige or relationships or reputation. Or perhaps worst of all, look at social media and all the other media that surrounds us. And and see how prone we are to worship ourselves and, and to play God in our own lives. It all robs God of His glory and it robs us of our good. It sucks the life out of us. We're submerged in it, just like they were. We're drowning in it too. Uh, And Paul could see it for what it was. It filled him with great distress. Uh, It's almost impossible to say how strongly he felt about it all. Um, It it reminds me of Jesus looking down over Jerusalem. Do you remember? Uh, Luke tells us about it in his gospel. He says that, that Jesus saw the city and when he saw the city, he wept over it. It, it describes a, a kind of gut-wrenching feeling, overwhelmingly powerful, uncontrollable, deep down. Jesus could see what was going on. Of course he could, and he wept. Oh, that the Lord would open our eyes to enable us 
to see things as they really are, so that we're not impressed by the wrong things or intrigued by them or, or vaguely interested in them, but, but that we would see them for what they are, robbing God of His glory, robbing us, the people of our good, sucking the life out of everything, submerging us, drowning us. It all gave Paul a new motive. He didn't just put his feet up whilst he waited for his friends to join him. This deep, strong, overwhelming feeling spurred him on in his mission to make Jesus known. Let's pray that, that the things that break the Lord's heart would break our hearts too, that, that we would have a new motive to spur us on in making Jesus known. A new mission field, a new motive next, a new method. What did Paul do with this great distress that he felt at at, at it all, he engaged with the people around him, and he did it in three ways. Verse 17, Luke says, firstly, he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. That, that was his usual method. He started with the Jews in the synagogues and, and the others who were hanging around at the edges. But then, Luke says, he reasoned as well in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. You, you've heard of the uh, ancient Greek philosopher Socrates, who lived a long time before Paul, one of the people Athens was famous for. Um, you come to the Kingswood Estate, we talk about John Wesley. If you, if you went to Athens, they would have talked about Socrates. And Socrates was famous for doing just what Paul was doing, standing in the marketplace, it was called the Agora, talking with anyone who happened to be there, the passers-by about his philosophy. And now here is Paul in the city of Socrates, doing what Socrates had done, but doing it for the Lord Jesus. Uh, now, our marketplaces might not function in quite the same way as they did back then, but we might ask ourselves if what Paul did in the synagogues might be the equivalent to us today of, of preaching the gospel at church services, what would be the equivalent for us today of what Paul did in the marketplace back then, speaking to passers-by about the good news of Jesus? It's a challenge for us as a church to find the equivalent places and opportunities, the equivalent ways of doing the same thing here in Kingswood. Uh, and that's not all that Paul did with this new method. Verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him, and it seems he began to debate with them. Uh, he was quite a versatile chap, wasn't he, Paul? Uh, not only speaking with the religious people in the synagogues and the passers-by, the ordinary passers-by in the marketplace, but also interacting with the intellectual and social elites within society, the people who influence general life, the people who made the decisions. Uh, and we don't have time to think about what those people believed and, and how that might have parallels with our world today. But the point is that, that they were some of the people of, of real influence in their day, and Paul engaged with them too. How can we do that in Kingswood? It's another really important challenge for us. Who are the people who really influence the culture and the daily lives of many people around him? Who are the people who, who, who make the decisions about our culture, our society? How can we engage with them with the good news of Jesus? See all these lessons that we can learn about mission in a mixed-up world? It needs to happen in at least three different ways, within the church, with, an, with ordinary people as they go about their daily lives, with people of influence who would have an even greater influence if they encountered Jesus. That's what this new method is all about, and it's a method for us too. Some of these philosophers ridiculed Paul halfway through verse 18. What is this babbler trying to say? They said that was one of their favorite criticisms. Others said he seems to be advocating foreign gods because he was talking about Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, talked about the resurrection so much that, that they thought Paul must have been talking about two different gods, Jesus on the one hand and a god called Anastasia uh, or Anastasis on the other hand, which means resurrection. It's a, a good reminder that the resurrection of Jesus was central to Paul's evangelistic message, must be central to ours too. But they gave him an amazing invitation, an opportunity to speak to the ruling council, the Areopagus, an opportunity which Paul used to speak again of the good news of Jesus. Which brings us to our next point. We've had the new mission field, the new motive, the new method, and that leads us to the new message. And I call it a new message not because it was fundamentally different from the messages that Paul preached before, but he presented it in a different way, in a new way. He focused on different aspects 
of, of the whole story of Jesus and his good news. Um, don't forget, this was a new mission field. Previously, with one brief exception, when Luke has recorded Paul's sermons, he has been speaking to Jewish people in the synagogues, and when he spoke to Jewish people, he reminded them of their history as the Jewish nation, as the people of God, and of all God's promises to them, and how they had all been fulfilled in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. But there's no point in him speaking to these Greeks about Jewish history. That history isn't their history, and so he tells a much bigger story, and for that reason, it's a new message. Uh, and first, he begins where they are. And that, I think, is a really important lesson about mission in a mixed-up world. He begins with a point of connection to their own lives and, and their own interests and their own passions. Verse 22, Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, "'People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully to your, uh, at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, "'To an unknown God.'" Well, there's another challenge for us. Mission in a mixed-up world, how can we find ways of connecting with the daily lives, the interests, the passions, the hopes and fears of the people of Kingswood so that we can begin where they are, make a connection, build a bridge, and share the good news of Jesus? If Paul was to give a sermon title, perhaps he would have something along the lines of the God who has made Himself known. And he goes on to challenge their idolatry very strongly. Um, he preached a five-point sermon, uh, I, I think is my way of counting. I've got five points today, and we're four, through four of them already, so that's good news. But I'm going to incorporate Paul's five points into my five points as well, so here we go. Um, so to these worshippers of an unknown God, Paul speaks of the God who has made himself known as the creator of all, the Lord of all, the sustainer of all, the father of all, the judge of all. I think just uh, for time this morning, which is running on, we won't, we won't go into all of those uh, in detail now, but do read this through later and look at how Paul takes this, tells this great story of the whole cosmos, the whole of the universe, the whole of creation, and introduces them to the God who has made himself known as the creator of all, the Lord of all, the sustainer of all, the Father of all, and the Judge of all. Uh, he, he puts a, a challenge right at the end, uh, wh which is with a very strong uh, warning. Having spoken of the Judge of all, he says to them, verse 30, in the past, he speaks, speaks of the patience of God, in the past, God overlooked your ignorance. That's what idolatry is. I ignorance, arrogance, claiming that we can't know God when God has made Himself known. But now, says Paul, He commands all people everywhere, commands, it's, it couldn't be stronger than that, He, he commands people to repent, to, to, to turn away from, from all other things and turn to Him, the living God, to worship Him and Him alone. It's the only source of life. He is the only source of life. We are without excuse for our ignorance and arrogance. And, and so, having had all our M's so far, the new mission field, the new motive, the new method, the new message, we come finally to the moment of decision with a mixed response. Uh, there was no avoiding the challenge. The God who has made Himself known commands you to repent. Some sneered, verse 32, especially when Paul spoke of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Some felt they wanted to know more but some did repent and became followers of Jesus by following Paul and, and believing in his Lord. At the end of verse 34, among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. How, how wonderful that was. And who knows how many other names will be added uh, as we too engage in mission in a mixed up world. Who knows? How many names will be added as a result of baseball camp this week with the evangelistic efforts that are going on? And, and if you too are a follower of Jesus, then, then, then your name might not be written in the Bible, but it will be written in an even greater book, the book of life, which will one day be opened by the judge of all, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. We've been thinking about Paul and his mission to the mixed-up world of Athens and some lessons that we can 
uh, learn within this mixed up world of ours. But perhaps you're feeling mixed up about what you believe, uh, whether you're here with us in Kingswood or watching online. Perhaps you're feeling some sympathy for these people in Athens who worship the unknown God because he seems pretty unknowable to you too. Well, what Paul said to those people in Athens all those years ago is, is true for you today too. The God who might seem so distant and so unknowable is your creator, your Lord, your sustainer, your loving, perfect, heavenly Father. People can have terrible experiences of, of, of human parents, can't they? We've heard about that this morning. We, we know people who have had terrible experiences, but this is a loving, perfect, heavenly Father who longs for you to know Him, and, and He is the judge of all. Uh, he longs for you to know Him. He has made it possible for you to know Him, and, and if it's not putting it too strongly, He commands you to know Him. Only He has the right to do that. And He does that for His glory and for your good because any other way of living will suck the life out of you. He makes Himself known to you through this beautiful, vast creation. He is the Creator of all, but most especially in Jesus who died on the cross so that you can have peace with God who rose again so that you can know Him today. Did you ever watch Outnumbered on TV? Um, a sort of comedy about three school children and their parents. Do you remember that? It be slightly annoying at times. I remember um, one episode in which the youngest uh, child was taught in school what to do if somebody tried to abduct him in public. Uh, he, he was to stand his ground, point to the person, and shout as loudly as he could, Stranger! stranger, which would hopefully attract lots of attention to come and help him and warn the other person off who would run away. Well, uh, of course, later in that episode, he had a bit of a falling out with his father whilst they were out shopping, so much so that, that his father had to pick him up, carry him out of the shop, and you know exactly what happened. He, he kept pointing at his father and saying, stranger, stranger, and, and the father had to keep explaining, I'm not a stranger, I'm his father. And, and, and it's probably pretty annoying for the father, but it could be pretty heartbreaking, couldn't it? Plenty of in instances of estrangement for all sorts of reasons in families. There are stories of parents knocking on the door of their offspring only to be told, you're dead to me. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking. How sad it would be to refer to our heavenly father, our perfect, loving heavenly father who, who made us, who gives us very life, longs for us to know Him, created us so that we might know Him, turn and say, He's a stranger to me. He's an unknown God. Turn to Him. Come to know Him today. And, and if you do know Him, then join in this mission in the mixed up world. It's quite a, an invitation. You're in a mission field too here in Kingswood or wherever else you are, you have a, a motive for mission. Pray that the Lord would open your eyes to see things as they really are. See the desperate need around you. You can use this method for mission. We're called to as a church as well, sharing the good news of Jesus, not only in church, but also with ordinary people in their everyday lives uh, and, and with those who have great influence that their influence might be even greater having encountered Jesus. Let's pray about how we can engage in all those three arenas as a church. And you have a message to share to a mixed up world of the creator of all, the Lord of all, the sustainer of all, the father of all, the judge of all, who has made himself known to us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And this is a moment of decision for you too. How is the Lord of all calling you to respond to Him today.